So I'm going to be speaking to you today about searching for life in our solar system. Now, as a Lewis, I have made a career out of doing this, and unlike him, I'm not going to tell you how many years I've been doing this. But what I can tell you is that the more I look at Mars, the more I look at the icy moons around the gas giants, or even the exoplanets around distant stars, I become more and more fascinated, amazed, and in awe of our life-friendly world. You see, to understand what alien life might look like or where it might be hiding, we can only really do one thing. We can study the Earth. The Earth is our single data point for life. It's the only habitable, inhabited planet that we know of. But what's mostly exciting is that even though this is the only place we can look, the more we look, the more life we find, the more environments we find, the more the solar system itself is lighting up with possibilities for where alien life might be hiding. So this is my favorite planet, the Earth, and I'm going to tell you why it is so special. As you can see, there is a lot going on. In its basic makeup, the Earth is a rocky world. It has an iron-rich core and a global magnetic field. It's littered with carbon, it's overflowing with liquid water, and all of this is encased within a thick, protective oxygen and nitrogen-rich atmosphere. And this atmosphere is incredibly important. It acts as a shield. It keeps the surface of the Earth warm enough for most of us that liquid water can be stable. It acts as a barrier. It prevents excesses of UV radiation from the sun from coming in and harming us. It also acts as a shield against incoming projectiles, such as meteors, space debris, comets and asteroids, which could do us harm. But what is most exciting about it is that the more and more we look at all these different places, we can see the Earth is incredibly geologically active. It is pulsing with energy. We see it when we see volcanoes erupting, when we have earthquakes, just when we have weather and rain, when we can see the tectonic plates moving and geysers and hot springs erupting. And this is potentially, in part, due to where we sit in our solar system. It's not the only reason, but it definitely helps. We sit at a very cozy 150 million kilometers away from the sun. In this region, which we call the habitable zone, or as I obviously call it, the Goldilocks zone, the Earth is not too hot because it's not too close to the sun. It's not too cold because it's not too far away from the sun. It has just the right temperature so that liquid water, which we know that life needs, can be stable on its surface. But obviously, if you're looking at this, you can see that we are not actually alone in the habitable zone. Right at the edges of it, there is another planet. And this is a planet where if someone asks you to imagine alien life or makes you want to think about where you might look for alien life, I am sure this world comes to mind straight away. And that's Mars. But what a stark contrast Mars is to the Earth. Gone is the blue and the green and the lusciousness. Replaced is a rocky world that's dusty, it's rusty, and it's basically a red desert. Even though it is rocky like the Earth, it's almost frozen in time. It appears still, it very sadly appears lifeless. But it isn't necessarily that way. It is literally a frozen world, because if you look at the volcanoes that dot its landscape, they're no longer erupting. You can see channels carved by ancient rivers that have now been left abandoned. There are seas and lakes, and they're just empty. This is because the water is now frozen underneath its surface. So what does that mean for life? Does it mean that all hope is lost as to where we might find life on Mars? Not necessarily. Because all the features you see on Mars, such as the ancient volcanoes, the ancient river channels, they tell you that maybe once upon a time, Mars was a much more geologically active world. So potentially, and we do think, that billions of years ago, when Mars and the Earth were both young, new planets, it was warmer and wetter. And potentially, it had a kind of environment where life might have been able to originate and maybe even go on to thrive. What happened to it? Well, Mars started to get cold, and it started to dry. Did that life go extinct? 
Or did it actually move underneath the surface and protect itself with the overlying rocks? We don't know the answer to that yet. But we do know that we need to still look to see if any evidence the early Martians were there has been left behind for us. And this is basically what I do. I look at environments across the Earth that mimic those that are now or once were on Mars. We do this because these environments and these features that are on both planets, the Earth is full of life in them. So if you look at volcanoes, impact craters, even though they have a very negative reputation, the dinosaurs didn't do so well out of them, but the sheer process of creating an impact crater creates lots of niches and habitable environments for life. We look at rivers, deep sea hydrothermal vents, hot springs, salt deposits. All of these on the Earth are full of extremophiles, life that can live in these really harsh conditions. Obviously on Mars, none of this activity is going on right now. But maybe in its past, life that could have arisen around these environments is still preserved. How I do this is that all these environments and all these processes can create rocks and they create minerals. And these are brilliant at trapping the evidence of life forms inside them. So, could we go to Mars, dig up some of the rocks from some of these ancient environments and find evidence of prior life? The types of life forms we're looking for? Sorry to disappoint you, none of them have eyes or faces or consciousness. We are looking for potentially just microorganisms, really hardy, resistant microorganisms. That would actually be an exciting result. More likely, we're looking for fossils, and even that is quite hard. Chances are we'll actually end up finding patterns and fabrics and rocks that we know could only have been created by microorganisms. And even more likely, we'll find a molecule that might be a protein or a fat that once belonged to life. For astrobiologists like us, this is the mecca. This is the most exciting discovery we'll ever have. For you guys, us telling you we found a fat on Mars is probably not going to be the most exciting thing you've heard. And although Mars is awesome, and planets are obviously the first place that can come to your mind, planets are not the only places that we're looking for life. We're looking on moons as well. In our Goldilocks zone, there are three possible moons, the moon, and the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. But we don't consider those somewhere that we might be able to find evidence of life, mainly because they have very little to no atmosphere and no surface liquid water. However, we're starting to understand that the Goldilocks zone in the, our solar system is not the only one. There are many Goldilocks zones in our solar system, but they're not circling around the sun at different distances. They're actually circling around planets. And that's meaning that we're starting to look at the gas giants, such as Jupiter and Saturn. And luckily for us, they've got over 200 frozen satellites that might be somewhere that we could look for life. I'm just going to mention just three of them that I explained about in Jim's book. The first is Europa. Now, Europa is actually a rocky world, but it's surrounded in the shell of ice. It's bombarded with ionizing radiation and has a surface temperature of around minus 190 degrees. So it's pretty cold there. This surface shell of ice is 62 miles thick. It's made up of water ice. And we believe that underneath that is a global ocean. And this ocean will have twice as much water of all the oceans that exist on Earth. This ocean will probably be warm. It will probably be salty. It will probably have oxygen in it. And we also think it might have organic carbon-based molecules. And it's being kept in this nice, warm, liquidy state because of the protection of the ice above and the heat of the core of Europa underneath. So where might we be able to find life on Europa? Well, this life might be present in the ocean. We know from extremophile life on the Earth that halophiles, salt-loving organisms, might be floating around in the water. Perhaps cold-loving and pressure-loving organisms might be living around potential deep-sea hydrothermal vents at the base of the ocean. But one of the big problems we have with Europa, apart from the fact it's a long way away, is how do we get to this ocean? We know oceans are good for life. We know this would be a good place to go and look for life. But how do we get to it? It's a 62-mile thick sheet of ice. And how do we get to it remotely and control robots from Earth to do that? 
Well, in just September of this year, we got some new exciting results from the Hubble Space Telescope. These little pixels down here, I know it's tenuous, just go with it. But these little pixels down here potentially are water vapor plumes erupting from the surface of Europa. If that is the case, we don't need to worry about getting through the ice to test the ocean anymore because the water in these plumes will have been derived from that ocean itself. So all we need to do, all we need to do, is to send orbiters and satellites to fly through those plumes and that might be able to tell us what is actually going on inside. The next moon, another icy moon, another icy shell, is Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. It's a little bit colder here, it's minus 200 degrees C on Enceladus. But what's mostly exciting about it, and what has gripped astrobiologists for a while now, is the fact that this definitely does have plumes of material erupting from it. The plumes here, there are over 100 of them, erupting from the South Pole out of cryovolcanoes. And it's made up of water and icy particles. Each individual plume that erupts it erupts over 400 kilometers into space. That's basically the distance from London to Paris erupting from this moon. And some of the material goes into making up Saturn's E-ring. Some of it just goes off into space. But I like that the rest of it actually falls back onto Enceladus as snow. But what's fascinating about these plumes, apart from the fact there are so many of them, is their chemical makeup. So when we've analyzed them, we can find carbon organic molecules in it, such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, and even we can see some volatiles such as nitrogen. And these are actually the chemical makeup that you find in comets. So inside Enceladus, we have all the ingredients for life. We have a watery ocean, which you can tell because there's water coming out in the plumes. We have organic carbon-based molecules in there, and energy, because the energy is what's causing these plumes to erupt in the first place. What kind, where and what kind of life might we find? Well, we can use analogues on Earth, such as hot springs and geysers, and salty water and lake deposits. These geysers are a hotbed, if you excuse the pun, of life. And although they're on a much smaller scale, which is very, very good for our planet, I don't think we could handle something like this, they are very good analogues for where and how life might be living inside Enceladus. And then we have Titan, which if I have to pick my favorite moon, this is definitely my favorite moon. And that's because it is so much like the Earth. Earth. It's deceptively Earth-like. When we look at it, we can see lakes and seas and rivers with liquid in it. We can see mountains. We can see dunes. We can see weather. We can see rain. But the difference is, is it's all made up of a completely different chemistry. When we look inside the lakes and seas of Titan, we see liquids, but they're liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. When we look at the mountains and the rocks, they're not actually made up of silicate minerals like we find on the Earth. They're made up of water ice. Instead of lava, we have a slushy water-ammonia mixture coming out. Instead of sand dunes, the dunes are probably made up of organic hydrocarbons. The rain on Titan is like smog particles raining down. What kind of life might actually live somewhere like this? Well, we can only wonder, because we don't have any examples on the Earth of the kind of organisms that might arise on a world like this. But there are a number of habitats that we do think life could be in if we were going to go there, and there were some missions that were planning to potentially send a boat or a submarine to go to explore the lakes. There might be life living inside the methane lakes. There is carbon. There might be life living just underneath the surface. And potentially, there is an ocean buried inside Titan, just like some of the other moons, and maybe the life is in there. It actually turns out that the total biosphere volume available on Titan is double what we have on the Earth. But we can really only wonder what kind of organisms might be there and what they might look like. And that brings me to this final slide, because a lot of people ask me about the relationship between science and scientists and science fiction. Do we love each other? Do we hate each other? Do we agree or disagree? It's a bit of everything, to be honest. But when we come to looking for life, and I've probably shown this a little bit, as an astrobiologist, I'm not really honestly looking for little green, gray, or purple men and women wandering around on other worlds. I'm looking for something that's like an extremophile organism, 
just like the tardigrade or the water bear. Although, to be honest, even finding that would be exciting. We're more likely to find single-celled organisms, potentially even smaller than that, DNA and the biological molecules of life, and probably even not even that, maybe just the ancient fragmented remnants of ancient life. But, as you can tell, this is a, involves a lot of educated guesswork and a lot of imagination, which I know scientists aren't renowned for, but it's something we very much have to have. So at the end of the day, I think it will show one day that scientists and science fiction writers probably both have it right. But who ends up being right, we'll have to wait and see. But to be honest, I think we'd all agree that's half the fun. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.